forget is Hulk smashed Betty Ross's heart so much she became Betty Banner. One half of a tragic love story that we're exploring today on Detecting the Marvelous. This makes it sound like it was a very sweet, special, romantic episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should have released this one on Valentine's Day. And I was like, I was realizing like I wrote like Hulk smashes Betty and then I'm be like Oh wait, I need to like really think oh, Susan. I was like, that real. sounds like way dirtier than the intention <laughs> <Yeah>. was. <laughs> I was like, there's a bit about a fan fiction in this one. Is that what he's gonna is that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, that my my um uh slash fiction about Betty and Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's I, that would be traumatizing. That that's just yeah. ew. Tonight we're talking about Max's, uh, yeah, Matt's fan fiction of like it's just like a romantic comedy, Hulk and uh, Betty, <laughs> yeah. super sweet, yeah. no yeah. deeper, sadder emotions explored whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Uh, so, yeah, what what inspired you to choose this issue? I think because I mean I don't know about now, but certainly I think as a kid this was my favorite single issue. I remember because wow. it came out ninety six. I would have been mm-hmm. 10. And it's interesting because like I've never really had like a major like other than a goldfish dying. Like I'd never had like, you know, someone really close to me dying. I guess a neighbor's uh, wife. But yeah, like it was never like it was not. Yeah, it wasn't something that was really. Um, yeah, that, like, you know, like so what like death wasn't like an issue that was necessarily on my mind or whatever, but. It just really, I think it just was kind of this first, like, uh, way of, like, seeing, like, grief really being explored in something I was reading. And I thought it it just really hit me. Also, it being a comic book issue where, like, no one's getting punched throughout the issue. And mm. it's in a Hulk issue. Yeah. Like, there's no, there's no major battle or anything like that that happens. It's, you know, like, a lot of exploring emotions and uh, discussing things. But, yeah. So I it just like I think it just it really stood out to me and I've like I like I've gone back and like I'd read it every now and then and uh yeah it still holds up for me. Awesome. Well, you made me feel very old because this came out when I was 22. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, well let me for those who aren't as familiar with the Hulk's history, uh let me share a bit about old school Hulk and then you can let the audience know about sort of what led up to this issue and give us a recap. Sounds good. Um, all right. Now written um, by Peter, uh, Peter David and Angel Medina um, inks by Robin Riggs colors by Glennis Oliver lettering by Richard Starkings and editors, Bobby chase and Bob Harris. Uh, we are pulled into the traumatic world of Betty Banner knee Ross um, before this interesting team took up the mantle, though, there were many creators of the Jolly Green Giant, uh, the Grey Hand of Fight, Fate, the Hulkmeister General. Uh, look, this is set in the 90s. I've got to get off my kind of like <laughs> rhyming and weird little nicknames. Um, originally created by Stan Lee and uh, the amazing Jack Kirby. Uh, this started as a, a pretty rote Jekyll and Hyde story with their signature twist. Uh, the struggle with rage, the drive to overcome monstrous nature, the drive to do good, even when raging. Um, the Hulk got his introduction very early in the new Marvel era uh, with him showing up um, in Dan- the, the Fantastic Four number four, which Dan previously brought to us in the literally in the margins of the book. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know, boy, you've never seen something like the Hulk. And the-, <laughs> <laughs> the Hulk's coming. like literally uh in the in the um now growing from a rage monster to uh an exploration of did disassociative identity disorder the hulk is much more nuanced than hulk smash it's kind of an interesting the different takes and how it evolved um in a 1979 interview um 
with the BBC, Lee said, well, one day I had to do too much to eat and drink, I guess. But no, what really happened is we made so many characters and superheroes. We were looking for something new to do. I'd always loved Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I loved Frankenstein. Now, to me, the monster in Frankenstein was really the hero. You know, he was he was nice. He didn't want anybody to hurt anybody. He, he went around patting kids on the head. It's the idiots with the clubs and the torches who used to chase him around the countryside. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a monster who's the good guy, you see, and let him change back, change into Jekyll and Hyde back like Jekyll and Hyde back into a normal person. So it actually is inspired by the classics, which is an oddly humble statement for Stan Lee to make. <laughs> um, like So, yeah, I was impressed. Kirby's take on the character, though, I think speaks more at what lays in the heart of the Hulk. There are people that I didn't like, but I saw them suffer and it changed me. Mm. I promised myself I would never tell a lie, never hurt another human being, and I would try to make the world as positive as I could. And I think that's what lies at the, co- the core of the Hulk. Oh, wow. um, the character, um, you know, struck such a nerve culturally. He would be on an 80s TV show, uh, in some cartoons, multiple movies, The Maestro, Mr. Fix-It, Planet Hulk, and a, and a bunch of iterations all before we arrived at our current Ruffalo Smart Hulk. Um, now, Smart. during this... Yes, Shulk. Uh, yeah. So, but during this journey, we got Peter David and Angel Medina's take on the Hulk. Um, Peter David, born... September 23rd, 1956, he won an Eisner in 92, a Wizard Fan Art Award in 93, a Huckster Award in 96, a Julie Award in 2007, and the Glad Media Award in 2011. Um, He is the grandson of Jewish immigrants who fled Germany in 1930s after their shoe store was attacked and vandalized. Uh, He was born in Fort Meade, Maryland. His father was a journalist. His mother was one of the scientists who worked with James Watson and Francis Crick in figuring out what DNA was. Oh, wow. Um, and that's that neat. is who. He, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that's such a neat uh, connection considering Peter yeah. David is like the Incredible Hulk writer. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like so much science is tied into the character. And he credits his mother with his sense of humor. Um, he. F- fell in love reading Casper and Wendy at the barbershop and then found Superman. His parents actually wanted to keep him away from superhero comics, especially Marvel comics, because they they didn't like monsters in their comics. David read them in secret. Eventually, his parents caved uh, and he started writing. um, Inspired by his father, Uh, he began by uh, reviewing movies from an early age, he was very progressive with view, uh, with his views regarding LGBTQ plus struggles. Uh, he wrote for Asimov's fiction, uh, science fiction in 1980, uh, wrote a few op-eds for the New York Times. Um, while working at Marvel, he attempted to sell multiple stories because he originally got a job as a salesman working in their shipping department. Uh, oh, and he, wow. they wouldn't let him do it because they're like, you know, you're in sales. You don't get this. You don't get the right stuff. But Jim Owlsley uh, was impressed and he bought Spectacular Spider-Man number 103, The Death of John DeWolf, um, and a career was born. Uh, He wrote for Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, uh, and he had 12 years, uh, a a 12-year run in the Hulk. Um, Growing up, he had a queer friend in junior high and high school, and he fought for positive representation in all of his works and in the industry in general. Um, now, Angel Medina, born March 26, 1964, he worked uh, first for Megaton, First Comics, Marvel, and Image, and has drawn uh, Berserker, Me- uh, Megaton, Dreadstar, The Incredible Hulk, Warlock and the Infinity Watch, Avengers, Spider Man, Sam and Twitch, and Spawn, as well as Kiss, Psycho Circus. Mm-hmm. So he's a very interesting artist. We get some very interesting visuals uh but uh, dan do you want to let folks know sort of how we get to the story in this issue and what happens in this issue for sure so i i think you need to go through a recap of 
This is Hulk 441, and so Hulk 440, which is funny because I never read it. Like, I got this one just randomly off the shelf um, because Hulk 441 was called, like, Hulk Fiction, and I was like, oh, I, like, I've, I hadn't seen Pulp Fiction, but I guess I got the reference, and... I'd hope not at 10, to be (laughs) frank. For sure, and, like, but, and I guess maybe it was, I was, like, like, about to go through puberty, and, like, the way She-Hulk looked on the cover, I was like, oh, boy, I better get this. Um, (laughs) so I think maybe that also influenced it, um, and it also, like, opened my eyes to She-Hulk. Thank you, by the way, also for that background on Peter David. I didn't know that. <clears throat> I didn't know about his involvement, you know, with fighting for LGBTQ rights. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, you know, about his whole background. But I do feel like he is the Hulk writer. And like that Peter David Angel Medina team was kind of the team that got me into Hulk comics when I was younger. Um, so basically right now there's this terrorist organization called the Alliance are led by this guy Omnibus, and the world is on a brink of nuclear Armageddon because of them. And so Hulk has this plan. So he like grows a beard and calls himself the Maestro, the Maestro, uh, not to be confused with Bradley Cooper's Maestro, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Bradley Cooper, who grows a nose and calls himself the Maestro. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> but um he like uh, who is like also known in other comics as like a futuristic version like a possible future of the hulk uh so he announces himself as the leader of the group and uh thor having recently had his powers restored he had lost them he got him back he goes off to fight the hulk uh in the north kind of to drag him away from everyone else <clears throat> so they're up in like the arctic circle kind of area I believe, and then so a lot of people like Doc Samson and uh, who's like the Hulk as a therapist, kind of like big strong therapist guy uh, and everyone else, like they all think like the Hulk has gone insane, he's lost his mind, but Betty reveals that Hulk had explained to her that he's going to do this basically to give a wor- the world a scapegoat for like him to be the uh, enemy to stop nuclear li- annihilation of everything and he's going to draw all the heat towards himself and so there's this uh, army uh, guy Matt Talbot who's watching this and so the original plan he works out with Thor is to for have Thor go into this berserker god rage you know and just like lightning the hell out of the Hulk and destroy him but they try it and it doesn't work and so Hulk and Thor, they keep battling and they're both like stronger and stronger and really destructive, but not no one's uh, getting defeated. And so he sees it. He sees them both as threats to the world and just orders a plane to drop an atomic bomb on them. And the Hulk sees the bomb coming and throws Thor clear of the blast while getting hit. And then everyone thinks he is dead for good. Uh, but when Betty is comforted, she just laughs it off, like because it's like ah, whatever. People always say he, Bruce is dead and he can't die, and <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. So here we go. We start in Sunville, Florida, where Betty Banner lights a candle and starts for basically as like a guide for Bruce, and starts typing on her computer. Bruce and I, and there are paparazzi staked outside her house and she hulk comes in they take her photo and she breaks their cameras and threatens them um interesting so like she talks about the paparazzi being scum and vultures so this was published may 1996 a year before princess diana's death so wow it was like at the like time when like paparazzi i guess was becoming a big thing but hadn't become like life-threatening so to speak in certain ways uh so then we go to army headquarters and Matt Talbot is celebrating the death of the Hulk. And then Henry Guyrich comes in who I can't remember if we saw him recently in something else we'd read. Uh, X-Men. X-Men. That's right. So yeah, he was an yeah. X-Men. That's right. Yeah. So he comes in and shows Matt a photo of him firing a gun at an unarmed woman, uh, Betty Banner. And like, sort of basically like this is like a, you know, something that's going to bring heat on you get you canceled uh and so then she hulk jen walters uh uh she hands betty her publishing contract and they talk about bruce and where they both feel like he's not really dead and they they know that he wasn't some terrorist as the public's painted him to be and there's a part of betty where there's a part where betty makes a joke and laughs hysterically 
which I found like actually was a very relatable reaction in grief. You know, when you're sad of having lo- lost someone, you know, it's almost like a joke amidst the darkness just hits harder than it would be on a regular day. And then you kind of get hysterical and almost laugh maniacally at it before going like returning to your grief. Uh, and so army, there's army personnel. They're digging up body parts from a blast by a cemetery. And someone finds a chunk of a headstone with no body whatsoever. And just one word fury, which as a kid, I did not realize. I just thought it was like, like I thought it was like fury, like the, adjective or the verb kind of thing but i assume this is related to nick it's nick fury's one of nick fury's fake graves yeah so that's what i which is what i only realized now having read it in 2024 for like the 35th time (laughs) um but there you go Uh, is nick fury actually dead he's kind of on the lam at this point he's like underground so this is a transition period for nick fury as one of the many times i guess where nick fury pretends he's dead so that he can yeah, yeah like sort of like live on the moon <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. To, to deal with humanity and yeah yeah and so um there's some funny stuff with uh then betty writes out uh, like these holocan romance versions of her relationship with bruce and uh some of them are very fun uh we cut to below the canadian ice fields where there's this uh a green guy with a big tall head named omnibus so he's basically under trial for being the leader of the alliance although it's not like a regular human trial there's like it's kind of this like secret trial they make an oj reference to just show the spirit of the times Mm -hmm. i I i'm sure they weren't the only comic book that was doing that but it was very much yeah sort of like everyone had to make their oj reference at this time uh, and so you go back to Matt Talbot saying like, oh, he just shot Betty with stun pellets and like the president will back him because he got the Hulk. But Guy Rich is saying the president will go down with him and this scandal is going to go national nationwide in a few hours. Uh, so it is really. Uh, yeah. So it is like basically also it's someone getting like canceled before, I guess, canceling was the thing that we said. But like, yeah, like he's basically going to get uh, get dropped from this thing. Uh, but I think that's the last we hear of him in this issue. And then Betty writes a Pulp Fiction parody about her and Bruce dancing. She writes this like Disney-esque romance about her and Bruce Cliff, uh, where she's kind of dressed like Belle from Beauty and the Beast, uh, which I'm sure is intentional. There's Meanwhile, uh, She-Hulk is on the phone with Doc Samson. Uh, she keeps calling Lenny about tracking down Bruce in New Mexico, but he can't find him. And then he gets attacked by a bunch of shadows, which sets up the next issue. Uh, There's a Babylon 5 reference in there. Uh, And by the way, and I guess spoiler alert for 442, for whatever reason, the shadows end up being them fighting Molecule Man. They kind of go away. They don't really come up in the next thing. It just switches to Molecule Man. Uh, And then, yeah, Betty's then, it goes back to Betty. And so she's writing a version of her as a nun dealing with the last time the Hulk had been quote unquote killed where she says the previous time Bruce had been taken from me. And it's a very sweet, thoughtful piece of her asking God to either take the pain from her or to return Bruce to her. And that if he did something awful to forgive him, if she did something awful to deserve this feeling, to please forgive her too. And it ends with her with the candle she's lit every night to guide Bruce home. Uh, and now I'm gonna go cry, but it was a very sweet episode that I really liked. <laughs> it's it's what it's like. I yeah, first off, it's like, hey Matt, here's a whole bunch of references from your first year of university <laughs> uh, yeah. going on. Because I mean, it's like kind of offset. Like the the references are a little bit dated uh, mm. because like Pulp Fiction was like '94 and and stuff yeah. like that. But it's just like what's what's hot at the time, and this was probably written when that would have still been much more ready, like press, but yeah, the art also is very of the moment because Medina, you wrote, you can tell he drew for spawn because there's a lot of weird proportions and exaggerated features. That's a very nineties yes. comic book thing, especially in the trial, like all the jury members yeah. in the trial. Of well, all they're not the humans. They're, they're all mutants. Right. They're all yeah. Mutants. So yeah, like but someone with like a jaw, that's like a teensy tiny jaw and like a big, like, 
It's almost like their yeah. head is like an upside down triangle or like a light bulb shape. Yeah, I think I, I've got to. Rem- I don't. I remember Gyrek was the Avengers CIA handler. I remember that. I can't remember. I think oh. those are all like the leader. Like they're all mutants, like the leader who were affected by gamma radiation. Mm. Um, so they've all deformed like that. Like you've got a purple person and you've got all these weird different mutated people. Um, but yeah, like some, I love the first image though. This first, per- you don't see this in comics very often. First person image of Betty lighting the candle. Mm. Um, so it's like through her eyes, you see her hand holding the, the, the light that's lighting the candle and her reflection in the window kind of thing. So it's very yeah. touching. And it's also like the entire issue is from Betty's perspective and you don't really ever get stuff from that where like Betty is the main perspective. Yeah. And especially like just in, I think a lot of superheroes, especially with the male superheroes, you rarely get the, like the love interest, the like damsel in distresses, like so to speak uh yeah. point of view and so i thought that was it was very well done the way he uh peter david did that i thought yeah. shara how did what did you think of it i this is one that i really liked it felt a lot chiller obviously there was no punching and stuff and it felt like they had like the moments with the graveyard and with the trial i think mm-hmm. on a first read those things went over my head a little bit more um For sure. because the story was with was with Betty. I found it mm. comical at times. Like of course there was this big grief that she was dealing with, but then it was like, okay, what are the ways that she deals with that grief in her writing? And the first thing that she does is writes this over sexualized like fanfic. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, nope, yeah. no, 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 backwards get back back face. That was really no. Um, yeah. which I thought was very funny and and also kind of relatable. Like you you're you're trying to see how you can and like Matt on your other podcast we talked about like different ways to deal with grief in in art mm-hmm. and how difficult that can be. And and I found an interesting humor in the way that she she did it. And that last nun scene was really mm. this culminating thing of oh in her writing she is she's asking for either forgiveness or to just have an like an answer find that find that you know not in a bow right yeah, yeah absolutely yeah i think and i think yeah like there was like a lot of humor from her perspective even for something that is like so you know like it's yeah like it's you know the death of like a loved one but like she's dealing with it sometimes in ways that are really funny. And even then, like she kind of sees the humor where she's like, Oh, I got to switch to decaf. And then like, delete. <laughs> <laughs> I found it. So, so she did become a nun in the comic book at one point. Oh, so that's actually nice. a real life perspective when she was mourning for Bruce thinking concerned because that's how she rebelled against her father who becomes later becomes red Hulk and she becomes red Hulk. Uh, at one oh, point, I realize, also, oh, I know, yeah, I never realized that was actually part of the canon because all the other stuff yeah. was made up. I assumed, yeah, oh. because I mean, one was Pulp Fiction, one was Gone with the Wind, um, right, or may- or Gone with the Wind, maybe like Little Women, like Heathcliff kind of stuff, yeah. like or so it was like some kind of fictiony Victorian mashup. Um, mm-hmm. But and I mean, but yeah, like that was her moment of like, OK, I'm going to be honest. I'm not like she got that advice from Rick, right, who wrote yeah. a book, became a millionaire and like everybody in the 90s became a talk show host like John Rivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got a, tra- That's, like a trashy cho- talk show. Host. Yeah. So you mentioned the Babylon 5 reference. So we had like a like a, so there was a general soap kind of reference with the Miami Vice suit and the the pinup girl kind of cowboy outfit she was wearing in the one interpretation you have a pulp fiction reference a star trek reference gone with the wind reference babylon 5 which i'll get to so rick is gonna become a talk show host right yeah and they're checking out i don't know who he's with i'm not that familiar with hulk but he was checking out the set he's like oh we want to get our band the generators well the generators are a real band um generation no, Jen, J E N N E, or or where is it? No, it's like the generators, but spelt like Jen. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the generators 
are a band that consists of is a sort of rock blues band, which contains Bill Mummy from Lost in Space and Babylon Five, and Miguel Ferrer from Twin Peaks and Thundercats. So it's like two actors and a couple of musicians. The two the actors are music, but I'm like, there's a lot of Babylon Five tie in here. So I'm oh, like, wow, this, yeah. but yeah, so it was a real band that contained a cast member of Babylon Five. Oh, I didn't 5. know that. Oh, did you? Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, that was well. I was just like, I was like, is this a real band? So I started doing digging, and I mean, I know a lot of pop culture from my youth. I did not know that. I mean, I knew the band seemed familiar, but I didn't really know that much about it. Um, oh, but yeah, so it was kind of weird. It's uh, that the weird connections with different things there um, and the, the heavy dose of pop culture. Yeah, like he really like inserted a lot of that. Yeah, like just so many references in there. It also yeah. reminded me, I feel like in the 90s and this time there was like a lot of and with Peter David, there's not like too much. There's not too many bubbles, like so it's not like crowded. Like I mean, one of the first issues we did when Matt showed like us some early nineties X Men where there was lots of lots of like dialogue bubbles and lots of pockets and, or pouches. And so now like he's like scaled it back, I feel like, where Peter David has found like just the right amount of dialogue and description, uh, yeah. without having yeah, like without it being too much, but still packing a lot of like story into this one issue because i don't they think there have... was i don't think there was any descriptive text was there like it was all dialogue driven i yeah maybe and if there is yeah, it's either dialogue or inner monologue Sorry? oh there's like yeah. meantime far beneath canadian fields like there's stuff like that um, right yeah the description but it's very far in in between like it's very it's very few few far in between yeah yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think you're. Yeah, you're right. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. There's almost. There's like none of that, and then it's all just, other than like just a little bit of Betty's inner monologue, which mostly is then through the writing. So yeah, like it is really. Yeah, like it is. Like they. He really. I think. I don't know. Like it really flows in there, and I think like there's enough story just in the Betty stuff alone. That you wouldn't even mm. need the other side things, but they're part of like the overall, like other arcing, overarching story stuff that's going on. Yeah. But um, it uh, like the that's just how much he crammed in. So he's able to like do the other stuff that like has to be in there for the sake of like larger arcs with what's going on in the Hulk canon. But like, is able to then still have so much story that's Betty related and dealing with her grief. It, it, it you know on a bit of a tangent it's nice to see rick like kind of winning for a change because he was sort yeah. of like the jimmy olsen of the marvel universe for the longest time yeah for like sure. like when the, well, the hulk was a early member of the avengers uh he was like the the avengers fan club leader and stuff um you know so it's like yeah he wrote a tell-all book which again one of the most 90s things to do yeah and <laughs> Uh, then became the late night host. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, and there's one like there's one issue I remember where like I think it's the Hulk becomes it's a little bit later where like the Hulk becomes like a horseman for Apocalypse or something mm -hmm. like that. And then Rick is trying to like coax the Hulk down, and the Hulk smacks him, and he flies and basically like breaks his neck, like smashing into a brick wall. So like. Rick really does get like knocked around and really gets like screwed over a lot. So it is nice to be like, Oh, well, you know, like he's got a trashy talk show, but at least he's got a talk show and he's doing well <laughs> yeah. and he's back on his feet. And <laughs> yeah, but he just something about him in that, like we don't see much. He's like, you know, Kirk to enterprise go kind of thing. Like when he answers his phone and it's just like, yeah. You annoy me on some level. You just like really <laughs> annoy me. You are a douche. I just know it. But yeah, I, I thought, you know, just and the again, like we were talking about grief it was very relatable. It was very understand. Like Betty is kind of in denial there. But by the end, she seems to be starting to find resolution. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Do, uh, yeah. do you have any further thoughts on that, Shahara? I no, honestly, I, I it felt almost hopeful at the end. Like she mm -hmm. felt like he was 
he was going to come back even like and i feel and i wonder how long she's going to continue lighting that candle for it's it's very very interesting in that way the, the character of omnibus is so weird to me um <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's all i gotta say like i have no idea like it's funny because i i have no idea the context at all um and i've never seen a character like like this where he has a pickle for a head basically yeah. and then well, and then yeah and then another green character who i was wondering if this is a hulkish character as well this like green haired well uh, gamma radiation green is like a side effect of that so you also see this with the leader who we'll see in the next captain america movie um and head swelling seems to be a kind of so- a common side effect yeah. as well because the leader's got a really tall forehead also yeah there, is there another also... character yeah oh no i was gonna say just another like green pickle-headed character in uh actually who's in fantastic four and who would be one of my dream roles to play in a movie is impossible man and so Ooh. he's this like alien from like he's a pop in from like this like distant planet that i ah! think Gal- galactus mm-hmm. might have ate his planet and he like has he like has this like un like unending uh knowledge of like he's basically like a walking pop culture reference from like u.s pop culture history <laughs> and i think that he'll like shape shift into like different characters and stuff like that um That's awesome. but yeah he's like just the but he's another like green pickle-headed character as well because he is just like he's got like a long chin and then a tall head as well he's like a little <laughs> alien. His, so the, he, the only difference between him and omnibus is omnibus's head is at the bottom of the pickle and impossible <laughs> man's head is like in the fa- his face is in the middle of the pickle yeah he's like a little (laughs) alien guy he looks like has pointy ears and big eyebrows like that is this impossible (laughs) man i'm looking at google's google images of him yeah yeah. he has a big thumbs down like oh i'm bad like that yeah but yeah he's like a mischievous character instead of like an evil character gotcha yeah that's cool and who is the character in those trial scenes who have like he has green hair and green he's not a, a hulk character is he or is he just a judge oh yeah the guy who's like running the trial yeah i don't know i haven't seen he almost looks like a green like gambit in a way like mm-hmm. yeah uh, has that same kind of like helmety thing that makes the hair stick up mm-hmm. yeah that's what i kept thinking yeah but I, yeah i don't know him as a character outside of that okay cool i, I wondered yeah. if he was more substantial because he is green i don't know but there's a lot of green uh, characters in this one yeah. i have to go back and reread around that he the other issues before and after. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, one of the things I would have, it would be interesting to see explored is the life of a partner of a superhero, like a, a human partner oh. um, right. and, yeah. and what that would entail. Because I mean, it is like one of my favorite Batman spinoffs um, was Gotham Knights, which was a police procedural all from the perspective of the Gotham, Gotham Central City. or Gotham Central. And then there's Gotham yeah. Knights uh, followed yeah. that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah so well, Gotham like, Central. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like the wire, but in Gotham. Like yeah. It, yeah. And, and uh, it's like, yeah. Sorry, go I was going to say, and also because we're, we've spoken, uh, speaking about Peter David and LGBTQ representation, there's a, one of the main police officers in that is a lesbian. In yes. Gotham wow. Central. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she's also in Birds of Prey, and I'm forgetting she her beca- name. Oh, her! Uh, Ro- Rosie, um, Rosie Perez Rosie plays Perez. her, doesn't she? Yes. Yeah, and she becomes the question. Oh. She okay. takes over as the question. Um, her and her uh, her partner becomes fate or something like that. Okay. Doctor Fate. I don't know. They 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 become super char- hero characters. Yeah. Um, but I, I so, do love that. Yeah. I do love Gotham Central, and uh, also written by. One of my faves, uh, Ed Brubaker. Um, mm-hmm. But that is cool. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Like, I'd love to see more of that. I actually made a short film about a Ooh. guy who's uh, dating a superhero um, once. And so, like, that is something that I would be very interested to see, like, a run. Like, if they did a run from, like, Betty's perspective or, like, it's just, like, a Mary Jane comic book or, yeah, you know, or someone else who's, yeah, like, married or dating a major superhero did they ever do a mary jane comic book because that seems like a fantastic idea that 
I feel like they should have done. <sighs> no. Um, I mean, she's featured prominently in the Gwen Stacy spider Gwen ghost spider yeah. spider woman stuff. Yeah. Like she's a, she's the lead singer of the Mary Janes. Oh, good for her. Of, like that's her band. Yeah. And Gwen is the drummer. <laughs> um, but there's no, because I mean, yeah, there's never been a Mary Jane centric. There've been one shots and stuff, but never a full series. Yeah. It'd be cool to see like a full series where you really, uh, yeah, I delve into that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any other thoughts? Anything anybody wants to share uh, before we, we hulk out? No, thanks. Yeah, thanks for indulging me in this. Uh, yeah, for this, like, where I wanted to do just, like, a one issue. You know, we did one with uh, Ben with uh, mm-hmm. uh, Wolverine. So, I yeah, this was the when we were doing that. I'm like, oh, I'd like this is, like, a one issue one that I'd like to do. Well, I mean, it's always it's always cool to see like cause there's always those like one it may be like an, not an entire run or an entire line, but like individual issues that can really grab you. So it's mm. cool to sort of like really hyper focus in on that one and and dig into it. So yeah, yeah. thanks, man. This is yeah, a really right. sweet one, and thank yeah. you, thank you for it. We need some sweetness every now and then. Yeah, not just punching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time to Hulk out. I got to go and write my fanfic where uh, I wear that Miami Vice. Suit that Bruce <laughs> yeah. was wearing in that one fantasy. Oh my God. Uh, thank, thanks for listening, everyone. You've been listening to Detecting the Marvelous, a Far From Here and ShowbizMonkeys.com co production. Their producers are Dan Rosen, Matt Ardill, and Shahara Ghaznabi. Music by Glenn Bouchamp and art by Ben Steamroller. Thanks for listening and remember, true believers, Excelsior! Excelsior!